Yes, we're good. Good? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay. Where was I? Right. So, answer being described every year that keeps going up. Um, and so, what makes ants unique? And, and one thing that kind of sets them apart from their relatives in the Hymenoptera is that all ants are social. So you have social bees and wasps, but the majority of those, um, the species in those groups are actually solitary, but all ants are, are social. So they have a, a, a cast. There's a reproductive cast, a non-reproductive cast. There's there are perennial colonies um, and there's overlapping generations and there's cooperative care of the young. Um, so in this photo, we have the queen here with the workers and the larvae in, uh, in an acorn. This is one of our acorn ants. Um, and just a, a diagram of ant reproduction. So the queen and males, these are the reproductive casts. The worker is a sterile female um, that, that cannot reproduce. There's, an ex there's some exceptions to that, but for the majority, of species, the, the workers are sterile females. Um, once an egg is fertilized, it will turn into, you know, it will go through these stages and then become a queen or a worker. If the egg is not fertilized, that's how we get males. Um, and, and from environmental cues, the colony will, um, you know, the reproductives will develop in the nest and based on the environment, you know, time of day, time of year, weather, um, you'll have nuptial flights. So here, the nest entrance has been expanded. You have worker ants patrolling the perimeter and a lot of, uh, a whole a lot of males getting ready for their flight. And so you have a flight where the queens and the males are mating here. And then eventually those queens will shed their wings and start their own colony. So why care about ants? Why do we study ants? Um, people ask me this all the time. They say, you know, what are ants doing for, for us? Why do we care? Well, they're, they're doing quite a bit in the form of ecosystem services and functions. So one of, one of these, um, you know, services is really nutrient cycling. Um, dealing with a lot of biomass in the in the environment, soil turning. So here we have the Allegheny mound ant makes these big mounds. They're turning a ton of soil from deep underground, piling it on top, aerating the soil through their tunnels. Um, and then kind of smaller species are, you know, nesting at plant roots and doing the same thing, aerating, bringing nutrients in, bringing soil from the from deep underground up. And then, you know, this idea of, of them being these garbage collectors. So this is, they found this dead spider. Um, and so they're working on that, trying to bring it back to the, to the nest um, and, and, you know, process this and kind of, um, you know, dealing with all this dead biomass from all the insects and arthropods um, that are all around us. Um, ants are really effective at, at finding that. And, and dealing with it. And then seed dispersal. So a phenogaster around here is a really important disperser of woodland herbs, um, especially the, the spring ephemeral wildflowers. And what these flowers have evolved is an eliosome uh, covering that's lipid and protein rich. So the ants are attracted to that covering and they're, they'll consume it bring it back to the nest and the, the larvae will eat it. Um, and so they carry around the seed, you know, maybe they get the covering off and, and leave the seed, or maybe they bring it all the way back to the nest, remove the covering and dispose of that seed in the refuse pile. Um, but, you know, that's how they're moving these things around and helping in the dispersal. It's not to say that, you know, ants are the only dispersers, but um, they are um, doing some of that. And globally, 
there's 11,000 plant species um, that are so far known to be to have ants as one of the dispersers. And so, yeah, our, some of our, our most beautiful spring ephemeral flowers are ant dispersed, violets, uh, trillium, bloodroot. Um, so this spring, when you're enjoying the spring ephemerals, you can thank your, your local phenogaster colony. Um, and then food resources. So ants are food resources for other animals. So woodpeckers really like feeding um, on the carpenter ants in dead standing wood, um, dead standing trees. Uh, and if you find some, some excrement, you might find little bits of um, you know, undigested ant um, parts um, here. So we have the, the Eastern carpenter ant that this woodpecker has been feeding on. Um, this is a common common ant. Um, and then, you know, flickers too, another bird that's a ground foraging. So they're eating some of the ground uh, ants. And then of course, um, in other parts of the world, uh, humans um, consume ants as food. And then ants are just super abundant um, in most terrestrial habitats. A paper just came out in 2022 that estimated the total number of ants on Earth to be 20,000 trillion. And that's, they, they calculated that they have more biomass than all wild birds and mammals combined. That's, that accounts for 20% of all human biomass. So they are everywhere and super abundant. Um, this species here, Allegheny Mound Ant, again, makes super populous colonies. There's like seven mounds in this area. They're all, it's probably one colony. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's you know, hundreds of thousands of ants um, in this one area. Um, this is actually in Massachusetts in a sand plain kind of heathland. Um, so this is kind of some lobish blueberry around here. Um, yeah. Every one queen? No. So this species has multiple queens. They'll have multiple queens in, in each mound, and then they'll kind of bud off of the main colony. So, so if there's multiple queens in here, eventually it might get too crowded. Uh, one of the queens will take some workers and go over and try to, you know, build their own nest and then more queens might come and and then it just keeps building um, but these are all probably related um, and then ants you know studying ant biology can have um, can be of interest to computer scientists and engineers to help solve problems right ants have been solving problems for millions of years um, and we can and we can learn about how they um, you know how they find food resources um, and apply that to our own technology. And then there's conservation concerns for ants in the Northeast. IUCN red-listed species, these are all uh, vulnerable to extinction. IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, um, all four of these species occur in Columbia County. Um, and I will talk more about these, but they're all parasitic ants. And I really like parasitic ants. This is another reason why learning about ants is, is so great because it's the natural history is really interesting. So there's two types of parasites that I'll talk about today. There's other types, um, but these two are kind of probably the most common that you'll, you'll come across. Um, so one, temporary social parasitism. Again, Allegheny Mound Ant um, with its large mounds. Um, this is a temporary social parasite. And what this means is that we will um, we'll pretend that these are queens. There are photos of workers, but we'll pretend they're queens. And this is a colony for the queen with its workers. Um, this is the parasite, Allegheny Mound Ant. Its host species, Formica substericia, and so in the founding stage, when this queen is mated and trying to start a colony, it will infiltrate its host species nest. So this is how it's able to, to start a colony. It can't start a colony on its own. 
Um, and there's some advantages to that because the odds aren't great to be a mated queen trying to start your own colony. Why not take advantage of a successful colony that's already established and utilize uh, an existing workforce? So, um, so this ant will, through trickery, you know, the communication is all pheromone based. So if she can smell like the colony, the ants don't know the difference. Um, and this is how a lot of other organisms, including beetles and flies, have taken advantage of, of ants um, by getting into nests and kind of using it as a safe place. Um, so how this ant will, will do that is it might kill a worker, you know, spread the corpse over itself, and it's going to smell like the, like the colony. And it can go in, and they're not going to know the difference. So eventually, that queen goes away. This queen is now being, her young is being raised by the host workers. And then over time, those host workers are um, being replaced by the parasite and until it's just the parasite. There's no more host. And so this is the temporary part of this type of parasitism where now they are, they're not being parasites anymore. Um, the host is completely gone. And now they're self-functioning on their own. Kidnappers do all of that, but then they take it one step further and they need to, they, some can't actually live without their host species. So they need to go raid the neighboring host nests and steal pupae and larvae, um, which are brought back and, and raised to do most of the work around the colony. Um, so that's, um, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, so you perform almost, uh, they have to disguise themselves in the same way? Yeah, they're, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so some, um, might be more, um, by force, but some, um, there's one species in particular that we have that has what E.O. Wilson called propaganda substances. And it, it actually releases an alarm pheromone that the hosts recognize and it makes them disperse. So the hosts will disperse out of their nest, basically leaving the raiders to just come in and you know take what they want. Um, so that's one way um, that they're using chemicals to kind of help. Um, and, and often the, the hosts are kind of more docile species. So they're not, um, you know, they're kind of gonna retreat more than more often than fight back. But um, so, yeah, so that's, that's just um, a scientific term for uh, this type of parasitism. So you might see that term, um, but if you're in the field and you see a mixed, nest where you have two distinct species, you've probably come across one of these kidnapping um, ants. And then lastly, um, you know, ants are abundant and diverse and we can, we can use them as, to ask questions about how diversity changes geographically. So I'm really interested in biogeography, kind of studying where species are and why, why how do diversity patterns change geographically? And so this, this map here is of vertebrate diversity. And we see this pattern for a number of different taxa where in the tropics you have hot spots and that diversity as you go away from the equator uh, gets lower. And so we can you know, use ants as a study organism to ask kind of why that's happening. Um, oops. So now we'll get into Columbia County ants. So most of our data on ants in the county comes from the Living Land Project. This, the field work for this was done 2012 through 2015 mostly. Um, but what we did was look at plants and select insect groups to learn about patterns on the landscape in Columbia County. And this will be coming out um, mid this year um, as a field guide. Um, and I 
want to clarify, I did none of the writing for this field guide. I just got to do the fun part and go out and sample ants and catalog those. Um, but the rest of the work was really is Conrad, Claudia, Anna, um, and our our uh, collaborator at Hudsonia, Gretchen Stevens, are really the ones um, behind this. Um, but that's kind of where a lot of our ant data comes from. And so Columbia County is actually a, a, an interesting place to study biodiversity because some people put it at this ecological tension zone um, between two different forest types. So you have the, the northern hardwoods here and the transition hardwoods, um, and they kind of meet right at the middle of the county. And you even have some uh, central hardwoods creeping into the um, southwestern most part of the county. But these transition zones are interesting because you can get a mixing of both northern and southern species in the same area. And so the idea is maybe you'd have higher diversity in these areas um, because you have this mixing of, of two forest types. Some of the southern species will be coming in, some northern species will be able to persist as well. And this is partly because of the big range in climate we have in Columbia County. So this is a map of mean annual temperature. You have a hill shade underneath, so you can see the topography. But um, you know, blue is colder temperatures, red is warmer. So the hills of Australitz, you know, kind of some of the coldest areas in the county. But then um, you know, the southwest is is a bit hotter. Um, and that difference um, can account for up to 20 days or more difference in growing season. Um, and this pattern is similar for precipitation. Precipitation is really correlated with um, elevation. So you get more um, precipitation up here than you do down here in the flatter areas. And so the idea of the field guide was to break up the county into different eco regions determined by soils and topography and sample representative habitats in each of those eco regions. So over um, you know, those three years of living land, but also some work in floodplain forests prior to that, some work on farm habitat, we have over 450 sampling points for ants. Um, so we've we've covered quite a bit of ground. Um, and what we've found, we've got 80 species and 25 genera. Um, when I left in 2015, we were at 79. There was an 80th species was found in uh, 2017, Nylandaria flav flavips. Um, this is actually a non-native species. It's from Japan. Um, it had been in New York, on Long Island, New York City, Westchester, New, uh, New Jersey. And it, it does seem to be creeping up. Um, so we only know it from one um, site so far in Claremont, um, but we did not find it in 2012 through 2015. Um, so it will be one to look out for. Um, luckily, we only have this species and one other non-native one, the rest are native. So pretty high diversity. This is over, 80 species is more than half of the New England ant fauna that's currently known at about 135 species. Um, comparing that to Berkshire County, Massachusetts at 63, um, that's likely to go up with more sampling. Uh, Columbia County has way more sampling um, than Berkshire County. So I wouldn't be surprised if that, that went um, much higher. And we found a few geographical patterns. So one is that of ubiquity. We have um, these species do really well pretty much everywhere. They're, they don't seem concerned with uh, differences in the climate. Um, a female gaster picea here, um, important disperser of those woodland herbs. Um, a forest species, very abundant in our forests. Campanotus pennsylvanicus. This is that probably that carpenter ant in your kitchen. Um, it will nest, uh, it's not very picky of where it nests as long as it's there's rotting wood around. So whether that's in your home, in the rotting tree outside, or in a rotting log in the forest, um, it's perfectly fine. 
And then Formica subsericea, um, also a bit of a generalist, but we find it in open fields, edges, and forests. And then we have some species that we don't collect in the northern parts of Columbia County. So Campanellus chromoides, for instance, generally in the region, it is the more southern species common in Connecticut, um, a little bit of southern central Massachusetts. You hit Vermont and you don't see it. You only see it in, around Lake Champlain where there's a bit of a more of a microclimate. The, um, the lake kind of keeps it a little bit warmer. Um, another acorn ant, Phenothorax curvispinosus, also has um, a bit of an affinity for warmer places uh, in oak forests, dry oak forest. Can you tell us what curvispinosus means? Um, it, it's referring to, it has uh, curved spines on its thorax. Yeah, um, they're pretty, pretty cool ants. Um, and then we have Eastern species. So if you remember the East is kind of where we have more of elevation. Um, so these species might be responding to that with temperature. And then we have uh, Western species. And that's where there's hotter climates. And in fact, these three species all, um, you, know, you can find them in pine barrens, super hot um, uh, habitats. Um, they like a bit of sand. And the, the western part of the county has the highest concentration of sand. So we have a lot of sand up, up here around Kinderhook. Um, but there's also kind of, you know, spots of, of um, quite a bit of sand. Um, outside of Kinderhook. Um, and this is from Glacial Lake Albany. And then we, we have five red listed species. Um, and within our 450 lots, um, you know, these are really rare in our landscape. You know, just a handful of, you know, one, two, three sites out of, you know, 450. Um, and the habitats, you have a mix. So you have um, former Coxzinus uh, was found in a shrub swamp, so a wetland, um, whereas Temnothorax americanus likes dry oak forests, where it's it's host species. So all of these are parasitic. Um, this one's a kidnapper. This is a kidnapper. Uh, the, these two are temporary. And um, I forget which this one is, but I think this one might be um, it's it's like a food, it steals food or something. So it has a little bit of a, a, a unique lifestyle. Um, but um, I have other habitats here because we found a few queens, wing queens, in, in a, one in a swamp, one in a shrubland. But when you find a wing queen, um, you know, you, it's hard to say if they actually um, made it in that habitat um, because it's just the queen. You're going to want to see a colony established so you know um, it could survive there. So it might have just kind of flew in and we've happened to pick it up. Um, but the rest, um, these three, are, are kind of open habitat ants. So, you know, dry pasture, cemetery. The cemetery had some sand, had some other kind of sandy ants associated with it. Um, you know, disturbed edges. This is also a sand lover. Um, common in pitch, uh, pitch pine uh, barrens. And then we can look at, you know, how environmental variables or climatic variables look at or uh, affect ant diversity. So here, kind of bend um, our plots into three different macro cover types, super generalized, probably too generalized, but there are, you know, distinct differences between a forested habitat and an open habitat you know, the canopy, um, and then wetlands, obviously there's this water um, attribute there. And and we have temperature here. So the general pattern for forests and open habitats is that in, in as the as you go uh, to warmer sites, you end up getting higher ant diversity. Um, it's the reverse for wetlands, and I'm not exactly sure why, um, it's not what I would expect, but interestingly, there's been some other work that's shown um, using temperature as a predictor for species um, diversity, for ant diversity, 
is not super um, uh, reliable in wetlands. Um, and, and I'm not exactly sure what's going on. It might be, you know, for some reason, maybe the, the wetlands here have more water. Um, you know, there could be variation among the years. Maybe the year we sampled some of these, it was super wet or something. Um, observer bias, there's all sorts of things, um, but it's it's still interesting and, and worthy of looking into further. Um, this teal line is the overall mean diversity. So we can also compare each cover type to the mean. So forests kind of, the they're kind of right at the mean, but open habitats have higher species richness um, than the mean. Um, that's kind of the pattern and then wetlands are, are a bit lower. Did someone ask why that one before was specifically in cemeteries? Yeah, um, so cemeteries can be interesting because they've been open habitat for a long time. They, they probably weren't plowed. So the edaphic conditions, the soil conditions have, have probably stayed pretty consistent for a long time. And in this particular cemetery, there, there was exposed sand. There was um, another species or two that, that liked sand. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's partly why we found it there, I think, is because of the, the soil conditions, the fact that it was open for a long time. Um, because this is a, a kidnapper ant, it needs robust enough populations of its host species to persist. And that host species does well in hotter, sandier climate or sites. Um, so that's probably a factor too. Um, but we only know this from a cemetery and uh, a dry pasture at Hawthorne Valley. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that ant um, later on. And then also, if someone asks a question, did you repeat it? Oh, yeah, sorry. No. Um, you mean from the audience? Yeah. Okay, yep. Um, so this is a map of kind of species richness where the hot spots are in the county. And so we get this, you know, kind of uh, Mickey Mouse shape <laughs> in central Columbia County. Um, you might say, well, you know, you've got this an area right in the middle that has a lot of sampling sites. And yes, that's true. Um, Hawthorne Valley is in here. So there might be some bias around that. Um, you also notice that the sampling plot total has decreased quite a bit. Um, I subsampled it to account for, to try to use data that was more standardized by, um, we had recorded the number of person minutes spent collecting in those plots. So I just used that, um, but this is kind of interesting. Um, and if we look at how latitude affects ant diversity in Columbia County, we get this, what we call a quadratic relationship. It, it's, it's like this reverse U um, where it, there's a peak right in the middle. I mean, it's not super, um, you know, it's not a huge peak or anything, but it is interesting that at the, the lower latitudes, so in the southern areas, you're getting fairly high diversity, maybe higher than the northern latitudes, though there is quite a bit of variation in here. Um, and then it, it kind of peaks about mid-latitude, and that's what we're seeing in this map. Um, so that is interesting. And if we, you know, put that um, hot spot about where it's supposed to be um, and look at the mean annual temperature, we see that this area does have a mix of, of temperature. So you do have some of that blue in the hills there and you have the bays and you have the hotter, flatter areas as well. And it might be a little more concentrated those, um, those three segments in here versus down here, where there's not really any blue up here, um, you know, maybe not as much of the beige um, so that's interesting. Uh, we can look at another metric, um, climate metric, heat index. This is based on number of days over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Um, it's important in predicting species southern range limits. So again, we're kind of getting this um, variety of heat index in this one area. It's kind of maybe more concentrated there compared to down here or up here. Um, so going back to the tension zone, which is they're putting it at the center of the county. And so I think, you know, that's might be what we're seeing. We're seeing northern species and southern species being able to coexist in, in the center of the county. And, and you know, maybe we're getting more species because of that. Uh, moving on to ants of the farmscape, Hawthorne Valley ants. So we've been collecting ants around Hawthorne Valley since for you know 14 years. Um, you know we have 37 species here, about almost half of the total Columbia County fauna, including two rare species. So this is a map of of the property here at Hawthorne Valley, or at least some of it. Um, you know we're around here, I think. Yeah. Um, and so. You know, you get different ant species in different habitats around the farm, and it's a you know it's a mix of forest of different field types of the the plowed land. Um, so ants of gardens, uh, we have the Labor Day ant, uh, named because it it often has its nuptial flights around Labor Day. Um, a very common open habitat, you know, lawns. Um, you know, field, it does really well. Um, the winter ant, Prinolepis in Paris. Um, this ant is called the winter ant because it it's one of the first to come out in the spring and the last to leave in the fall. So it does really well at colder temperatures. And that's kind of the, the niche it's, it's in. You know, it's out where other ant species um, usually aren't. And it's able to, to forage them. Um, and then we have the pavement ant, the Tremarium immigrans, one of the non-native ants we have often um, found in those really disturbed, you know, lawns um, around the farm fields. Ants of forests. So you get some species that um, don't exist in the other habitats, in the open habitats, like a Phenogaster picea. You have an, an acorn ant, Temnothorax longispinosus. Um, you know, you're not going to find that in open habitat. Uh, a citronella ant. So these, when disturbed, they actually smell like citronella. That's the alarm pheromone. And then ants of dry fields. So these fields are, are these, you know, they have thin soils. They're here, they're, there's some shrub, shrubby, um, you know, plants there, and they're not super productive agriculturally. They, you know, they're pretty marginal, and um, you know, we can zoom into those. You know, this is a photo of, of one of the fields in the fall after a mowing, and these are kept open by mowing. Um, you know, the cows are grazing here, and these dry fields, these dry pastures, are important for rare ant conservation. Um, and if it weren't for the farm doing the management, um, these two species, one being IUCN red listed, the Amazon ant, this for microprociliata is 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 um, a new record for the Northeast, um, and it it exists in these thin soil fields and pastures. Um, another ant that's characteristic of some of these fields. The uncertain ant for Mica inserta. <laughs> I think it's just because the the Latin name inserta. Um, it's probably has to do with uh, that it was like somewhat ambiguous to the um, idea or something. Like it was like, well, I you know it's like hard to idea. It kind of is hard. Um, it might have something to do with that. I'm not sure, but um, it might be. It might be in our, my book, The Field Guide to New England Ants. Um, and these actually are, um, you know, they these interact, or at least these with this species. Um, so we have parasites, 
um, you know, the kidnapper and the temporary social parasite. So these depend at least partly on this species to, um, you know, to, to uh, persist. So the Amazon ant kidnaps that uncertain ant, raids its host, steals its brood. Um, and this one is completely dependent on the host. If it doesn't have the host, it will die. Um, it has these really specialized sickle-shaped mandibles. They have these serrated knife edges on the inside. And so these are really great for piercing exoskeletons, but they're really impractical for doing anything that an ant actually needs to do to live, like nest maintenance, care for its brood, or even feed themselves. So they are completely dependent on their host. Um, and that's these kind of specialized life histories kind of make them vulnerable because if the hosts aren't present in robust enough populations, um, they're not going to persist. For Mica prociliata, um, people have described it as striking and beautiful and rare and unusual. Um, I would agree. Um, I like this photo because it kind of gives you some ID characteristics. This ant has its propodium is very squared off here. That's kind of char um, characteristic of this ant. Um, the other species that are in this group don't have that. It also has a nice um, brush of hair on its pronotum. Um, beautiful kind of golden hair. Um, and before we were looking for ants in Columbia County, this species was, was known in the Midwest only, and it was rare in the Midwest. Um, it's farthest east it had ever been collected was Ohio, um, and yet we found it um, with some regularity. I mean, 15 sites in Columbia County. Um, it's not ever, it's never been found in New England or anywhere else in New York that we know of. Um, it could be, um, but it, it seems to be pretty happy in Columbia County. Um, we see it here in a heathland with lobush blueberry. Um, it makes very populous colonies. Um, this is like a three foot diameter circle. It's kind of a disked low, it's not a mound, it's just a, a disked um, flat uh, um, nest. But we, we mostly find it associated with these dry fields, um, often with little blue stem grass. And maybe um, one reason why the sand is here and not somewhere else is this: these maps show the proportion of the county's land and improved farmland over, over um, the years. And so if you go to 1997, um, you see that we actually have more of our land in improved farmland than the surrounding counties. And so I think um, Columbia County has conserved some of its open land and the hilly terrain and the soils, these, these kind of dry, thin soil um, pastures and fields um, may have persisted here longer than in other places. And that might be why um, this ants here. But um, yeah, that's just, that's just a guess at this point. Um, and um, yeah, it would be really interesting to look in other places. Um, for my masters, I did some work in the Berkshires. Um, at some higher elevation heathlands and wasn't coming across it, but it might be too high elevation. And I'm wondering if the taconics, if they're not able to kind of get up and over those, but it's still a mystery of why they're here and whether or not they're anywhere else besides the Midwest and how they got here. Um, and now going into ants as pests and predators slash beneficials. So that's the question, is it a pest or a beneficial? And when you look into these relationships, you realize that um, it's really not so black and white. Um, many of these organisms function as both. And so, you know, ants as these omnivorous um, feeders and kind of general predators on all sorts of things, um, you know, they can be beneficial in agriculture. So here, this mermica 
is um, you know taking a caterpillar. I don't know if this is a pest caterpillar, but um, caterpillars are pests, and and ants can go after those. Um, you know, seed eaters. So thinking about um, ants that pr predate um, weed seeds. This is that Fidoli pilifera. Um, it's I, this is a bit of an aside because this is one of my favorite ants in <laughs> Columbia County because the major workers have massive heads and it looks really weird. Um, so this is the major, this is a minor, different casts. They have different jobs in the colony. The majors, they use their big head to block nest entrances to keep predators out. And they also use these big mandibles and huge muscles to break open seeds and dehusk them. Um, and so that's their function, whereas the miners are more the foragers. They're out more, they're collecting the seeds. Um, and this, this species likes sand, so it could be on farms if there's, if there's quite a bit of sand around the edges, um, it's possible. Um, but this one, um, I'm interested in looking at closer and its relationship with seeds. I've, I've observed this ant, the pavement ant. It's not native, um, but I've observed it in my own garden um, collecting seeds. And um, yeah, so it might be, might be doing something beneficial, um, but it could also be dispersing weed seeds if it's not consuming them, it forgets about them and leaves them places and um, brings them into the nest and then it could germinate maybe in there. So it's definitely, um, you know, iffy if it's going to be beneficial or not. Um, decomposers and nutrient cyclers. So, you know, thinking about like post harvest, if you have, you know, the rotting fruit, you know, produce that wasn't taken, um, ants are going to be one of the organisms that are helping kind of decompose and cycle those nutrients back into the farm fields. And they're also going to be around the plants you know, moving soil, aerating it. Um, so they might have a benefit there. Negative aphid tending. Ants like to do some of their own farming. Um, they, they'll eat the sugary excrement from aphids. So aphids suck plant juices. They need the protein, the nitrogen, I believe, and they excrete the glucose that's left over. Ants love sugar. Um, and so they will, you know, in exchange for that sugary liquid, they'll kind of protect the aphids. So if you have parasitoid wasp that wants to parasitize these aphids, the ant might be trying to fend that, that wasp off because it wants to continue feeding. Um, so this might be, um, yeah, a, a non-beneficial relationship in agriculture, um, tending aphids and other um, bugs that do this, scale insects. Um, and so just to sum it all up, um, you know, Columbia County has fairly high ant diversity and, you know, it's partly climactic range is, is um, a bit large. There's a variety of habitats. So this mosaic of open forested habitats, wetlands, um, all um, support different suites of species. And, you know, some of the soils, the sandy soils are supporting kind of a, a somewhat unique species assemblage. And, um, you know, that's kind of, I think, partly um, what, why we have such high ant diversity. Um, Columbia County is home to at least five regionally rare ant species. These are the IUCN red listed ones. Um, we could probably add two more to that list, one being the Ohio ant. Um, that's rare outside of Columbia County, as far as we know. Um, and then there's another one that we've only found once that um, is kind of just generally rare in our region. Non-intensive agricultural management on marginal fields plays a role in conserving some of these rare ant species. Um, and this habitat, dry fields on um, you know, thin soils, might be particularly important to conserve as our climate continues to warm. So these, you know, drought prone habitats that are already dry and hot sustain species that can deal with those conditions. And as the climate, as we continue to see more drought and extreme temperatures, 
we want to, you know, stock, if you will, the landscape with some of these species. We want to make sure we have species that can deal with those conditions, um, and so they can move, you know, where they need to go. Um, so that habitat might be um, particularly um, in need of, of continued conservation. And then ants are both beneficial and non-beneficial in agricultural systems. I think this warrants closer um, you know, research into some of these common garden and field species, looking at how, how exactly they're interacting with seeds and, and other insects. So with that, um, thank you for listening and I'll take any questions. So, how acute is the vision? Um, it depends. So the question was, how acute is the vision of ants? Some species are almost entirely subterranean, and they're basically blind. Other species, um, yeah, their vision's probably okay, but most of the time they're they're moving throughout the world. Um, in a smell based, in a pheromone chemical based. So it's, it's um, you know, it's probably not great. Um, but yeah, like this species here, you know, it has its, its compound eyes, but then there's also the simple eyes on top, um, the celly that um, can kind of detect differences in um, like light um, shadows and stuff. And so it's kind of important you know, to evade predators or, or just to assess, you know, it's cloudy or something. Um, but they'll, they have those as well on the top of their head. Yeah. Um, so I'm a teacher and I got my students to eat some ants. <laughs> and, um, uh, they're sort of uh, sour when I was telling them, don't know if it's true actually. <laughs> they have formic acid to protect themselves. And then I saw a lot of their genus names were for mica, is that related? And, can you tell us more yeah. about the acid? Yeah, so the, the question was, um, this fellow had his students eat ants and they tasted a bit acidic and vinegary um, and wondering if that's because of the formic acid. And yes, um, ants, these ants the in the genus Formica, but um, there's also other genera um, in the, um, yeah, like Lazius and, and other ones that they don't have stingers, they have a, a formic acid sprayer. Um, so that's how they're, um, you know, dealing with predators and, and disturbance. And, um, and also, you know, it, it works a little bit as a herbicide too, like that big nest in the low bush blueberry of the Ohio ant, they're probably, biting stems and spraying it with formic acid and trying to, you know, keep it clear. Um, but yeah, so, um, you know, you can use, maybe you can use some of these formica on your salt and vinegar chips or something. <laughs> or instead of uh, Roundup. Yeah. <laughs> the sprayer is near the cancer? No, the sprayer is on the, the back end here. Yeah, so they'll, you know, they can, um, you, you could probably find a, an image online, I'm sure you can, that when when these ants want to spray, they'll kind of get up on their legs and tuck their abdomen underneath them oh, and okay. can be able to point it and spray. Yeah. <laughs> could you explain how they eat and where the food goes? How does it get digested? I'm, I'm just shocked at how tiny the connections are. That's a good. Uh, I mean, how, why would they just break apart? <laughs> yeah, so the question is how do ants feed themselves? They seem to have this very um, small constriction between their, um, you know, their abdomen. Um, and so, yeah, that's a great observation. And so they have a mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and, <a trust. laughs> and it needs to get through all the way. Um, yeah, so. They don't have teeth, right? Oh, no, they do have teeth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some. 
some uh yeah like those those amazon ants it's kind of a, a specialized mandible but um and they can't feed themselves um but these will have yeah they'll be there'll be little teeth all along the mandible um so actually most of the adult ants really consume liquid food. Um, they're not really consuming hard food. Um, and so so the larvae are the ones that are consuming um, non-liquid food. They're bringing food back for the larva. The larva don't have this constriction. They're kind of just one little wormy thing. Yeah. and And they'll they'll eat it and then they'll excrete lipid rich excretions on on the the larvae will excrete that on their body and the ants you know lap that up um so yeah there there was an interesting paper i can't remember it just came out recently they kind of described that relationship with the larva and the adults and that you know the ants would not, the adult ants would not persist without the larva and, and they have a stomach uh, and a circulatory system. I forget in my eyes. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, do they have a stomach uh, and a circulatory system? Yeah, I I believe so. I mean, they're right. they're having to digest and and do all that. Um, yeah. yeah. There's there's probably some of something of a nervous system and all of that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So how far down? Uh, I mean, is there a limit to how far down into the ground they go? I mean, yeah, I, I. So the question was, is there a limit to how far ants will go underground? Um, it it depends on the species. So there's there's a a researcher who who use uh, uses molten aluminum and pours it down like fire ant nests and and can see you have a cast of the nest and sometimes these things are 10 feet you know deep um so it'll depend um In no these these are the southern fire ant yeah this is a, a species in the south um that's originally from um south america or something um invasive fire ant um and but you, yeah. Did you, when you were studying here, did you like uh, uh, excavate down or dig down to see how far, how deep they went from the surface into the earth, or is that not really part of what you would? Um, okay. No, the question was had I ever dug down to see, um, you know, how far the ants are nesting and, and the, see the chambers? Um, no, I have I have not tried to dig um the nest. It it could be interesting. Yeah. One time um that nest in the blueberries, the Ohio ant, we we tried to get a queen and we took a shovel to it and it you know the workers are just pouring out and it was like there's no way we're gonna get anywhere near the queen. Um but yeah, that would be interesting for sure to see. Um people do it, people excavate, you know, they'll excavate. Fungus farming ants, and you know, study the what's going on in there. And um, I've heard of people you know, using not aluminum, but you know, doing casts using other like plaster or something, and mm -hmm. um, actually counting how many ants are in the whole colony mm -hmm. um, that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it, it would be neat to to see. What happens in floods? When when do they all die, or do they have a Yes, yeah, so the question is what do they do in, in floods? Um, I would think they're able to kind of block off, um, you know, some parts of the nest so they're not flooded and they can just be underground. Um, you'll often see like after a rainstorm, you'll see them kind of moving soil out of the nest and, and opening it back up. Um, interesting, the southern fire ant because it evolved in the in like the Amazon, it deals with floods by creating a mat and it floats. The colony floats. <laughs> it goes together and yeah, just floats on to dry land eventually. But like I remember one of the hurricanes in Texas, they were um, warning people if you see this black mat, 
do not touch it because it's you know firing it. <laughs> but so that's one. Yeah, so they just just come out and just ride the the water. Um, but that's how they kind of dealt with the you know changing conditions around the Amazon. Um, do you have any advice of keeping ants, clean ants? Um, I have never kept ants. It's something, it's, it's been a, on my mind, but I, I do not have any advice, unfortunately. I know there's some, there's definitely a lot of resources online. There's um, communities of ant keepers, um, and I'm sure you could um, find something there. Um, but let us know if you are keeping ants, because that would be a great way to observe what ants are doing and see the the tunneling um, and everything. So um, I've been trying to keep them. It's just that they all like never laid eggs. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, I I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess it, it, if it's it was a queen. Cool. Um, yeah, maybe it's a food issue, maybe, you know, making sure they have water um, and a food source, um, maybe the nest medium, maybe they just weren't mated. Um, that could be another another thing. Well, they did not have wings, but maybe they're not, infer not infertile. Oh, I forgot what else. But um, if you do plan on keeping queen ants, um, put them in test tubes. Okay, that's a good good tip. Test tube, that's a good idea. Thank you. Um, we do have another question about um how ants interact with um microbial fungi, possibly in the form of or or just yeah fungi in general, possibly spreading like root fungus. Yeah, then I would add on if they contribute to spore dispersal. Oh, things things I do not know anything yeah. about. Um, I generally ants um, they try to keep themselves pretty clean. I, most a lot of them will excrete like an antibacterial, antifungal on themselves because you know being in a colony you know, having disease, having, you know, fungus is not going to be a good thing. So, you know, that's why they're not great pollinators, because if they have pollen on them, it could just kill the pollen. Um, but yeah, I'm sure they do have some diseases, though, and I'm sure there's some fungus and um, that it gets through. Um, I, you know, the only thing I I know a little bit about is is there are some fungus farming ants. Um, we don't have those here, but they are in New Jersey, like New Jersey pine barrens, um, where they actually cultivate fungus for food underground. Um, and so that's a really interesting relationship that people are are studying, kind of the evolution, how that happened. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Interesting question. Um, you know what they're doing with how they're affecting mycorrhizal. Um, yeah, if they're spreading um, fungi, yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the Conrad. Uh, so, what are they doing right now? Do they just shut down in winter, or are they more like honeybees? Do they might stay active a little bit? Yeah, um, I think it depends on the species. So, our our common carpenter ants will kind of fill themselves with a with a antifreeze, a glycerol. Um, uh, uh, chemical, um, so they'll be able to just kind of hang out and and not freeze. Um, you know, other species that are nesting in the ground can you know go below freezing level. Um, other ones might be, yeah, able to kind of hang out in diapause and and you know whenever it gets. Usually, the rule is if it's if it's sixty five degrees, that's when most ants are foraging. But um, yeah, so the glycerol or just being underground um, are two strategies. But do they gather yeah. food from the Um, I'm not sure how how much they're kind of prepping. Um, that's an interesting question. The winter ant 
Phrenolepis imparis is related to honeypot ants, and those ants have repletes. Um, so workers that actually store food, um, they ha have a, they're able to expand their gaster here with food and store it, and then other members of the colony can, um, you know, feed off of it. So they're probably doing some of that storing, um, but otherwise, yeah, I'm not sure. Like. Yeah, if there's how much turnover there is, like, are a lot of the workers just dying off? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dig, dig down <laughs> in frozen ground. Do they have a lifespan? Um, yeah, so it depends. Um, I think like the yeah, someone kept the queen in captivity for like 30 years. That's like the, the longest, but probably in the environment, um, you know, worker whose life is probably pretty short. Um, you know, they can, a worker out foraging is susceptible to all sorts of, um, whether it's ant collectors or, you know, big birds or whatever. Um, there's all sorts of hazards. So they're, they're probably not around that that long. Um, other queens probably years. Um, I don't I don't know if some are getting into a decade. I'm not sure. Um, but some of those colonies will persist for decades. Um, but like the Allegheny Mound Ant will have multiple queens, and so if one dies, you know the other one will take over, and the the colony will persist, but it might not be the same queen for that entire time. Yeah. Um. Or less time is going on. Um, connecting the habitat research you've done and the, the person's question about keeping ants, like how about maybe a little more realistic is like keeping habitat for ants and people's, you know, private property. So are there hints? Is it the typical just like keep native plants that are? Yeah. Um, near certain areas? I mean, definitely if you have any of these like little blue stem meadows, those have high high ant diversity. They're also important for native plants. Um, yeah, so probably just doing what you're doing if you have that, that habitat. Um, but, um, you know, yeah, I'd be, you know, having a diversity of habitats will have a diversity of ants. So forests, um, you know, open wetlands, all going to have um, some overlap, but you know we'll have unique species. Um, but yeah, as far as other management, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Depends on the property, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. So if you wanted to identify an ant, or if you found certain ants you wanted to identify, would you? Is there a place you could take them to have them identified? Yeah, I mean, if you want to send them to, to us at FEP, I'll take a look at them. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise, um, I don't know, maybe some extension agents. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, you know, we're here to field your ID questions for sure. Or you can use it as a documentation. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can add, add ants to our data for sure. Um, iNaturalist too. Um, this is a citizen science um, app that people take photos of organisms in the wild and upload it and people can ID identify it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can actually, a lot of times you can get to at least the genus level from a photo, or even like a cell phone photo. Um, the species level gets a bit more difficult, but um, that's another way to, you know, see if you can get IDs. Um, FEP as a team, we're kind of monitoring iNaturalist and, you know, looking at the observations in Columbia County. And uh, so we could help you um, if you're on that. Um, okay. Yeah. Anything else from Zoom? Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you.